Now, I'd like to introduce you to Sherry Nicole, a dynamic HR executive renowned for her strategic prowess and tactical, tactical finesse. With a focus on driving positive change, Sherry shapes and solidifies workplace cultures to attract top talent. Her impressive career spans achievements in HR, organizational development, and change management. Sherry is a transformative coach, aligning HR vision with business goals to elevate leaders to new heights. Please welcome Sherry Nicole. Oh, thanks, Tracy. What such kind words. I feel like I'm flush now with all that. <laughs> Thank you so much and uh, welcome everybody. Um, so yeah, today we're gonna talk about uh, onboarding and retention and how they kind of intertwine together and how they kind of complement each other. Um, and uh, yeah, so hopefully you're, you enjoy the session um, and uh, I'll get started. So uh, a little bit about myself and Tracy was very kind in her words. Um, uh, but yes, my name is Sherry Nicole, and uh, I want to thank, uh, first of all, I want to thank FPSC uh, for inviting me to participate in the Speaking Food series. You know, it's really great to be here with you guys today. Um, I am an HR consultant, and I am located in Prince Edward Island in the East Coast. Um, I've been in the field of HR for probably close to 30 years now. Uh, I've worked in several industries, including food processing, uh, agriculture, IT, lottery, grocery, uh, name a few. Uh, but most of my time has been working with uh, the food industry, whether at production facilities uh, or processing facilities. So, um, you know, I've been working with uh, FPSC now since 2020, um, so a few years. And I support uh, one of their programs, uh, the Stack program, and uh, I design some of the courses in that program. And I also host an HR Coaching Moments, uh, which is a 10-part series, uh, which is currently, we're about midway through that right now. Um, and, and that's a great experience too. So, so yeah, so I'm excited uh, to spend some time with you today and go over onboarding and retention. So can you share your screen? Oh, sorry. It's not shared. No. Oh, I'm sorry. Just hold on a second. Just a minute. Sorry about that. I thought it was already, I thought it was already showing. You can see me okay? Uh -huh. Okay. There, can you see my screen now? Sounds good. No, sorry about that, folks. No problem. Um, okay, thanks, Tracy, for letting me know that. I thought that was already up. So, uh, yeah, so... A um, couple of things um, on uh, me. So, um, you know, I shouldn't for today now, I shouldn't take probably more than about 45 minutes. Um, and then, uh, like uh, Geneva said, we'll leave some uh, questions room at the end for questions. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, like I said, probably about 30 years partnering with business leaders, uh, HR advice, coaching with them. Um, I do development with HR resources, setting up strategies in companies for probably since the late 90s, uh, not to date myself, but uh, for a while now. And uh, what I do, uh, I do a lot of work with uh, creating HR department design. So I'll go into new companies and kind of structure an HR, the HR model. Uh, or I'll go into companies that maybe are going through mergers or acquisitions, and I'll do a little bit of facelifting to their HR model. Um, uh, spend a lot of time on management skills coaching. So whether it's general manager level, middle management, supervisors. Um, I do, like I just mentioned, I do uh, a lot of 
merger acquisitions is a bit of my background. Uh, so companies that are going through that, I come in and facilitate the people side of it. Um, restructuring, change management, all that kind of fun stuff. Customized leadership training, similar to what we're doing today. And, and I spend quite a bit of time on uh, core competencies, behavior stuff and performance management and and the list goes on. Anyway, so I have my own consulting company that I started uh, just recently in 2020. Um, and uh, I'm having a good time with that. So uh, yeah, just a little bit of background on me. So uh, I do have a small team. So it's just myself and Gabrielle um, and her pictures on the screen there. So Gabrielle is um, an HR grad that has been for, with me and has been very helpful uh, with me for over the past year. So you'll have a, an opportunity to meet Gabrielle a little bit later in the presentation. I'm gonna get her to, to speak about some of the HR practices that we're talking about today. Um, so let's get started. Uh, like I said, the session today is on uh, onboarding, the onboarding process and about retention and how they kind of complement each other. So why should we focus or maybe refocus our attention on onboarding and retention? You know, I'm going to share a few things, uh, a few, some of my thoughts today on how you can make some slight changes that will hopefully make a lasting impact on your company. So I'm all about providing helpful hints and I'll give you some insight into some things that I have done in the past. So, or that I do now with some clients. So um, what I have on the slide here is uh, actually, I read this article, um, I wanna say like maybe a couple of weeks ago, it wasn't very long ago. And and I saw these stats and I thought, oh, this is, this is kind of, uh, key for what I'm talking about today. You know, I find them quite interesting. I'm going to go through them in a second there, but um, I'm not kind of surprised by them as to like what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing, uh, the challenges out there. And most likely you probably feel, feel kind of the same way. So like the first, so I'll start on the left there. So the first 45 days of employment, they account for up to 20% of employee turnover, meaning within the first 45 days, 20% of the people you lose leave within that 45 day window. That is frustrating, I would say. And that might be, you might have a different word. I, I would call that frustrating, especially with the effort that you have to put in to recruit employees. And within 45 days, like a little over a month, and, and then they're going and 20%, it's not the end of the world, but it's still, uh, still a high number. Um, employees integrated with effective onboarding programs are 69% more likely to stay for minimum, like around three years. Three years, what I'm finding with the generations that we're hiring, that's kind of uh, the average service out there with, uh, with a lot of positions. Not all, I don't want to stereotype, but... Um, three years, I wouldn't be surprised if people are looking for something different uh, after a window of three years. But 69%, um, you know, are saying if the onboarding's good, I'm going to stick around, right? So that's that's big number, right? Close to 70. So 78% of employees would stay with their company if they saw a career path during their onboarding. Well, that's interesting too, because I wonder how many of us are talking about career paths during onboarding. 28% of recruits leave their jobs after six months. 58% uh, of organizations focus on administrative tasks during the onboarding process. That's big. And I'm not surprised by that because that's where that's what we've been doing for a long time, right? And we call it orientation, right? And uh, so about 60% of us uh, that's what we focus on. I'm going to take you a little bit deeper into what that that looks like on the onboarding side today. 87% uh, of human resource experts consider retention to be the highest priority for businesses right now. Yes, because the market is competitive out there and to recruit and retain 
top talent and especially good talent it's it's not just a, a paycheck is what's not a re, that's not that's not the recipe to retain them today so i'm going to talk to you a little bit about that as well um new employees take about 8 to 12 months to become as efficient as their coworkers that's an interesting stat i didn't know it would be that long but uh you may say yeah that that's that's kind of the norm within our business but interesting stat to kind of throw out there employees are benefiting from extended onboarding programs reach their first milestone 34 times faster than other employees. So 34 more times faster if we invest a little bit of time and effort into having um, an, an extended or solid onboarding program. I think it might be worth our effort to do that, right? Managers are 20% more satisfied with employees who have received formal onboarding training probably because there's things that are covered during the onboarding training that they don't have to invest the time in. It's more about the relationship building. That's what I would say. But I found those quite interesting uh, when I saw them and I just thought I would share. So, you know, if all of this is a true reflection of what companies are experiencing today, then we have a little bit of work that needs to happen uh, to help keep employees happy and content at our workplaces. So let's see what we can uh, what we can come up with today. So I'm going to start with uh, retention. So I'm going to take a little bit of a deep dive into what it actually means. Uh, that'll help us kind of figure out you know, what we can make, uh, what can make an impact on retention or what can make it better, right? So retention is, if you think about it, and you probably already know this, that retention is just really simply retaining employees to stay with you. So, you know, I like to look at kind of the symptoms of when it's not 100%, meaning if it's kind of low, what are the flags? that or what are the symptoms that I should be seeing in my culture or in my workplace? So first one is, the first one that I kind of hone in on is what does the morale look like? So low employee morale, unhappy employees are less productive, they're less engaged, and they're most likely to be looking for other work. Morale can be low when things are kind of disorganized. Maybe treatment of employees is kind of inconsistent. I see that a lot. Uh, or there's confusion. Confusion about the priorities or maybe the processes or what's expected of them and their job. Um, you kind of, those are kind of the top ones that come to mind for me when I think of why employee morale would be low. Um, another one that um, would be kind of a symptom of when it, it's kind of off the rails a little bit is that lack of, there's a lack of recognition. So employees want to be recognized and appreciated for their hard work. And if that isn't part of the company culture that you have, employees are less likely to stay motivated and encouraged. So you want to be like looking at that a little bit deeper, right? What does recognition and I'm not talking about dollars, like it could be, it could be just even, it could be simple acknowledgements of thank you, or it could be a bonus, or it could be like maybe a celebration event, or, but some form is necessary to maintain like high retention rates in an organization. So I'll put that on the radar as well for us. Okay. So a couple of other indicators that retention might be low is maybe it's about the relationships, right? Your role as a people leader is to build and maintain healthy, positive relationships with employees. When relationships aren't good, it leads to higher turnover because people don't want to stick around. You know, one of the big ones that comes up is consistency. That's what like I got to coach on that a lot, right? 
Each team member needs to be treated equally and consistently. You can't have multiple sets of rules because you're going to have you're going to be impacting the retention of the people in the workplace. Priorities, maybe expectations, goals, all that should be all outlined. So employees know exactly kind of what is expected of them. I like doing that at the front end, right? That I paint the picture and I, and that's some of the language that I use is that I like to paint the picture of kind of what I'm expecting, what kind of good looks like through my lens. And then there's like, and then ask me a million questions about it. So that we're, I need to get, get employees on the same page as me kind of quickly. That's kind of how I do it. Um, Benefits, wages, you know, it's always part of the mix, but employee salaries and other benefits, they're, they can be a big contributor to turnover if they're not aligned with what's going on in the market, right? But you don't have to be the leading employer in the market, but you have to be in the game. You have to be competitive in the marketplace. So make sure that you're you are competitive and align benefits to what employees kind of want. The reason I say that is I have, I have an example for you. I have a story for you. You know, um, several years ago uh, now, I was implementing a group benefit plan, like health plan uh, for a pretty large company. And uh, they, um, the structure was that there was a board that you report into at this company. And, um, the board wanted to pick the best option. They wanted the decision of what benefit plan we're gonna be going with. So I presented a couple of different scenarios and uh, they're like, we like this one. And I'm like, yeah, well, I don't know if that really lines to what the people want, but why don't we park that decision? And why don't we go find out what employees want we'll just do like a random survey just kind of go out and it could be I think I did it kind of casually through conversations when I went to different facilities whatever anyway it turns out <clears throat> that what employees wanted was something completely different and it was it was it wasn't even close to what the board or the senior leadership felt was important because it was important to them, they felt it was important to others. But when I went out and talked to frontline workers, that's not what was important to them. It was a whole other list of things that they wanted to be included in the group benefit plan, which it was, it, it happened many years ago, but it was always a great learning for me that you know I don't ever dismiss trying to get the pulse of employees. Uh, whenever I'm trying to implement anything. And this just happened to be a group benefit plan. So I would say my two cents for you is kind of keep that stuff in mind because the cost of losing an employee can be much higher than if you just need a little bit of a pay increase or you just need a little bit of a shift on what the benefit plan is. And those, are, I'm just giving you examples, but like put it in, look at the big picture, right? That it, is it really worth not doing those little pieces that are going to make the employee group happier? So anyway, just my two cents on it. Um, that might not be the scenario at your place, but uh, so what does it look like when you don't have issues with retention then? Because those are kind of those were kind of flags that I kind of wanted to to put on your radar. So when everything is great, like what what do you see? Well, you see like teams like that have really good relationships. They're very productive. They're engaged in the work that they do. They enjoy coming to work. They actually say that that they like coming to work. Um, you know, you have better employee morale. You can feel it in the culture. They're happy. They're motivated. You, you can you can feel it whenever you're just walking around. And another thing is that you have loyalty. Is that you have people that not just loyal employees, but you have knowledgeable employees. I, you know, it was several years ago, I was talking to a leader. He was, he was an older leader. And he said to me, he goes, I like to call that institutional knowledge. And I'm like, yeah, okay. I don't know if that's the right term or not, 
but it always, every time I, I talk about this topic, I kind of hear his voice in my head. But what he meant was, is that you can't replace the knowledge that someone that has long service and that knows all the ins and outs and ups and downs and has been through the storm of the company, that what they bring to the party is it's it's so valuable. You can't even put a price tag on it. And so whenever you you focus on having an engaged workforce, you focus on retention, you reap the benefits of that. Right. And, uh, you know, I I think that's just great. And, and, and I hear that in his in my head all the time, him saying that to me. But, you know, you could be saving or I, I like to kind of say repurposing time and money whenever you are you have a uh, high retention. So you recruit less. And then I like to say, you know, you're not really saving money, but you're repurposing it. You're putting it into those things that are going to even encourage longer retention with employees. So those are the things that kind of come to mind. Like, and I'm giving you like a very high level um, uh, overview of some of these topics or some of these points, but um, that's kind of what comes to mind whenever I kind of say like, what, you know, what, um, when everything's great, what does it look like? Right. So that, those are kind of some of the things that come to mind for me that whenever I see when, uh, engagement is really, is really good and retention is good. So, so over the years, um, you know, I've had leaders approach me and they'll say, you know, our turnover is, is out of control. Like, can you come help us? You know, we can't seem to keep the good employees. Like, what are we doing wrong? And so I thought you might find this helpful is like, here's some of the things that I put together for my kind of initial review with those leaders. So I usually sit with them and, and say, okay, well, I need to interview you, right? Uh, and I get them to answer these kind of questions because it gives me some insight into what the issues may be, right? And because sometimes if I just blanket ask, like, you know, so what are the challenges? Sometimes they're not able to articulate them for me. So that's why I kind of ask probing questions because then very quickly I can kind of figure out, right? So you can, uh, you can ask these questions to yourself as I kind of go through them. Um, and, you know, you can kind of evaluate your own, your own culture and your own company. So here's what I kind of focus on. So I asked, like, have you provided the right material, the tools, the resources for the employees to be successful? And did you show them how to be effective using them? Like, what does that look like whenever you hire a new person? So tell me what you do around that. And the other thing I would ask them is, what do you offer employees? Are you competitive? Kind of like what I just mentioned a couple minutes ago. So I do a little bit of a dive into that. You know, is there enough perks in play to keep your high performers here? And how often do you look at these? Like, how often do you look at the perks that you have? If they haven't changed in probably 10 years, you might need to do a facelift, right? Because it's all about creating like the excitement and you're trying to retain people. You want them to be excited. It's a dangling carrot principle, right? So are you considering what employees want? Kind of like my example with the benefits, right? With that group benefit plan, right? Understand that, you know, I do a little bit of training on generations. So understand that generations that work for your company, like understand them a little better. Like what, like what motivates them? What motivates the age group that you have uh, employed with you? Maybe it's not money. Maybe it's flexibility. Maybe it's acknowledgement, maybe it's career advancement or development or development dollars put aside for them every year. Um, I, I don't know what it is, but like it might not just be the money thing, right? So I kind of asked them about that. And what does your hiring process look at? I don't want to know, you know, the stages or the full cycle recruitment process, but I want to know 
how do you hire? Do you hire for fit? And do you understand your culture well enough that the ones that you are hiring and the fit that you're looking for is going to complement your culture or not? So, and then what do you do for onboarding? And we're going to get into onboarding a little bit deeper, but that's a big one. It's a big one. The onboarding, what does that experience look like for your folks? And do you have a conversation with employees? Do you get their feedback? Do you know what they want, what they need, what they kind of value important uh, from a work relationship? Um, you know, in employment, another thing is the employment agreement or like their offer package. You know, what like, you know, what does that look like? What do you have in it besides, you know, you start date and your wage? You know, is there benefits part of that? Did you incorporate language in there around learning and development, you know, or even mentoring, right? And is there a career path for them? And did you talk to them about a career path? Do you have performance conversations with them? So all of that, I know it sounds like a big laundry list, but it's very insightful when you kind of look at some of that stuff, right? Like, what are you actually doing? Um, in your company right now. So I thought you might find that helpful, a little bit of a checklist uh, on kind of what I kind of hone in on uh, whenever I'm starting to do some work with uh, with certain companies that have uh, turnover issues. So I have an example for you. I have another example. Uh, a few years ago, I was, this is about retention and about onboarding. But a few years ago, I uh, was in Toronto for meetings with my employer at the time. And uh, and when this, uh, th this manager approached me and she said, uh, she goes, oh, hey, Sherry. She goes, I have a new HR person here starting today. And can you sit with her? And I'm like, well, uh, yeah, maybe for a bit I can, but I flew in to, for other meetings. So I'm like, yeah, I know I'll sit with her. She goes, well, I'm I'm going to go. I have other meetings to go to, but I'll loop back in about an hour. I'm like, okay, yeah, I could sit with her for about an hour. I got an hour to spare. So so I sat with the new HR manager and I told her about the company, how things were working, how things worked and who was who. And I, I pulled out an org chart for her and all that kind of stuff. And, and then about an hour later, I just said, I'm going to go see where your manager is. And because uh, I have other meetings that I have to go to, but, you know, she should be back. She said about an hour. Manager never made it back to the employee until after lunch. It was several hours later. Needless to say, she didn't return the next day. What a bad experience that lady had, right? Like the new hire, she was so frustrated. I felt so bad that I kept trying to do little check-ins with her that I'd, she just, she didn't, what she said to me, she said, I don't even feel like you guys want me here. And I'm just like, I wasn't even part of the hiring, <laughs> like, you know, but I'm in the middle of it. Right. And it was awful. It was awful. And it was, you know, and then the manager comes back. I think it was like, oh, it was later in the afternoon. And she came back. She's like, oh, where's so-and-so? I said, she left. She's gone. And uh, like, you know, I don't think she's coming back. Right. Um, so reason I'm telling you that I don't, th I don't think that's an isolated incident because I have several other examples that are similar to that. You know, here's another one that I'll give you that this just recent, this is recent, like last couple of months. Um, I was supporting this leader and uh, he was uh, hiring a new production manager uh and the new hire started onboarding plan you know mapped it all out what was going to take place because i don't work at that location but i support them um and it's so it was all arranged leader didn't follow any of it didn't do anything on the list right and not not only that <laughs> but after a few days the manager didn't even want to communicate with the new production manager anymore so, and he would send messages to other staff to go tell this person this message. He was ghosting him. And eventually within a month, the new production manager reached out to me and he said like, you know, like he doesn't want me here. So I'm just leaving. Like, this is crazy. 
And, you know, the guy was young, he was energetic, he was good people skills, he was trying to make a difference. And the manager, uh, the general manager was setting them up to fail, right? And again, I felt so bad about that. Like, it was just, it was like, what don't you get about like the people? Like, you know, don't you want them? If you didn't want to hire them, don't hire them, but don't make the experience like that for new hires, right? You know, so you may not have the same experiences that I'm sharing and, you know, uh, and, and that's okay. Um, but what you can mostly, most likely relate to is the feeling that I'm talking about, right? Where, you know, the feeling that that new hire had, it wasn't good, right? Or both of those new hires, it wasn't good, right? Um, anyway, I wanted to share it because, uh, we're going to ask, we're going to have a poll. So we have a poll coming up on the screen. I think Geneva is going to be putting them up for you. So, and I would love if you would kind of share some of your thoughts on this. So based on the examples that I just gave you, have you ever had a similar experience where you felt that way, or you saw that happening or, um, yeah. Or, or you heard about it. Uh, just kind of curious. I'm going to keep motoring though, but uh, but fill out that, that uh, poll if you wouldn't mind. That would be great. It kind of helps me give it, putting examples together for future sessions if I know that they're relatable. So, all right. So now that we've kind of explored retention a little bit and, you know, you got some kind of best practices kind of in your toolkit, right? I want to kind of shift and look at onboarding, okay? So what is onboarding all about? So onboarding is kind of the process of supporting a new hire, how, how they adjust to their new job. And we want them to adjust quickly, smoothly. That's kind of the, the process around it. And it's like you're helping the new hire adjust to the social and the performance aspects of their new job too, right? Or think of it as you're kind of integrating them into in the new hire into the company, right? And it allows them to be familiar with company cultures, policies, all that kind of stuff. And they have maybe have a better understanding of the company through this process, right? And they have a better understanding of their role and like how they can, they can contribute effectively as a team member, right? So that, that kind of, when I say onboarding, those are the things that kind of come to mind for me is that it's that experience that they're having They're They're finding out information. They're finding out how they fit in it, right? Uh, you know, onboarding programs like help new hires kind of understand the roles and responsibilities and get comfortable with the atmosphere. They meet their colleagues. They learn the company policies, all that. that that's kind of the sense of it, right? Another thing is, Onboarding is a, it's a crucial step in an employee's employment journey with you. It makes them feel appreciated right out of the gate and, and being part of the team, which the ramp up time for them to be effective is shortened whenever you have a really good onboarding experience or an on, onboarding approach for them, right? Uh, uh, it is, it's a key process in ensuring that your new hire feels comfortable and is supported. And so that, that's kind of like my soapbox speech for what onboarding is all about. All right. And I'm going to take you on a little bit deeper dive into this. So I like to coach on that onboarding process should be is structured structured, strategic, focus on people rather than the process. And when you're preparing your onboarding approach, it's kind of imperative that you kind of look at it from a short and a long-term goal. 
And so some of the short-term stuff you would be familiar with whenever you do maybe orientation with employees um, and uh, and then flipping it over into the onboarding of you know the experience that they're having. But so for instance, in the short term, whenever you look at short term onboarding processes uh, or approach, uh, you're likely looking for things like getting an employee excited about working for the company. That's what your that should be your agenda. Ensure that your employee can do the job and they have all the tools and the resources that I talked about a couple minutes ago. You know that they complete that essential paywork, uh, uh, pay, um, paperwork. Sorry, that is necessary, like for the payroll and and all of that to get them set up on payroll. So, and you go over company culture, maybe the background, and it's all about helping them transition. Um, as from being hired to now in the culture. So sometimes it's about, you know, you'd be doing like things like um, if they have to get logins or keys or anything like that or any any of that necessary stuff. So, and there's always, the big thing is there's always that introduction uh, to the current staff. So those are kind of like, if you could use that as a bit of a checklist to say, okay, did we do this, 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 and this? Those two examples that I just gave you, I wish they had a focus on the short-term stuff because the experience would have been better for both of those two scenarios that I talked about. So I would use this, uh, what I have on the screen, I would use this as, are we doing this? Because this is minimum, right? That you're doing this whenever you have a, a new hire coming in. The other thing that I would focus on on is the long term, but think about this, and this is kind of where retention kind of creeps in, is that when you think about the future, your onboarding should be aimed to be focusing on things like promote continual learning and training. So those kind of conversations, you know, will continue to happen. You keep your employees, you want to keep your employees around. That's the whole agenda on this with the long term. And you want to ensure that an employee has like there's growth built in and there's development bit built in besides the learning and the training stuff. And you want to create a, an environment a continuous environment, not just, you know, the first week that they were there, but create an environment where employees feel appreciated. And so again, little checklist for you, 30,000 foot level um, on the short and the long term stuff that I would focus on. Um, and if you have like, do it, we do this, we do this, we do this, like, good for you. Like, that's excellent. If you do, if you can say yes to all of these. Um the other thing that, you know, when people ask me about, about doing onboarding training, they'll, you know, I'll, I'll say, well, what kind of on onboarding training are you talking about? Because like, I like to break it out. And that's probably one of the first things that I say to them is that I kind of see onboarding having three different avenues to it. So there's like the company onboarding where you are kind of teaching them how things work, right? The first is teaching like new employees the information that they kind of need to know, like I've already talked about. And this is like the standard checklist, right? Of things to discuss from pay to parking, right? Where where all where they can find all that stuff and, and give them all the details of it. One thing I think gets missed in this, uh, in the company onboarding stuff is acronyms. Oh my God, I find this frustrating. Like acronyms that companies use. Trying to figure this out is super frustrating for newbies, okay, for new hires. I've been there more than once asking, I'm sorry, I don't even know what you're talking about. What does LRF mean? Or what does LMS stand for? Or whatever the acronym is. It's like, it makes you feel even more like an outsider when they don't provide that. Like, please do me a favor and put, ac and you know, like kudos to you if you already do it, but it's the most frustrating thing that new hires experience is this acronym thing. And just like a simple glossary of terms goes a long, long way. I experience it all the time, all the time. And I find it 
I'm just, and you know what? Some, some things is an acronym at one company doesn't even mean the same thing at the next company at all. And they're using the same acronym. They're using the same letters. Like, uh, anyway, I, I just, not to get on my soapbox about it, but <laughs> uh, anyway, I would uh, like, please incorporate that. If you, if you can, you will make a whole lot of people happy. Um, help them. The other thing with the company onboarding piece of it, it's about helping them integrate or fit in. Right. So help new uh, new hires fit in. So you share, you talk about values, you talk about practices of the company, especially during I see that as kind of like a first year thing because you can't capture everything in the first two weeks or the first month. This is where, you know, traditionally we've talked about intervals where, you know, the three, the six, the nine months or the weeks or whatever, whatever works for you. Like, but I would say that there's this series of kind of offloading information that has to happen around the company stuff, right? Because they're going to have uh, the first year is going to be a year of firsts, right? And so as a hiring manager, you want to be discussing and taking time to discuss maybe some of the history on certain times of the year, maybe how the branding evolved, like how performance is measured once you get into like a performance cycle or how development of skills and growth opportunities happen here. They're not going to retain that if you do that right in the first couple of weeks, but kind of like progression on, on some of this information because it's very, very helpful. And it's not, there's nothing more frustrating than go, trying as a new person, trying to go find where all this information is. And most of the time you learn it like at the water cooler, right? Or you're emailing or texting somebody or messaging them. So the other thing that I would say on the company side is encourage like the mentors, right? To connect with new hires and share personal stories. You know, when I first started, you know, they don't have to be like, um, like the buddy system. Now those, those are work very well in a lot of companies, but just somebody that can kind of go and, and take them under their wing a little bit, even if it's just one conversation, but sometimes if you kind of pinpoint some folks and kind of ask them to just go and share personal, you know, this is what happened when I joined or I just joined a couple of months ago. Sometimes uh, there's there's benefit in getting like somebody that was just recently hired uh, to be part of that. So, so I look at company onboarding and the processes around that. That's kind of where you would see kind of checklists and stuff like that. Um, and, but, and, and the kind of the relationship building a little bit with the leader, uh, then there's position onboarding. So this is where you have the opportunity to kind of define the job and what good looks like around that job, just because someone's hired, you know, for their capabilities and experience doesn't mean that they know how to do the job at your company. And sometimes we forget that, right? They don't know the processes and the things that happen at your company versus how they did them somewhere else. You know, new hires with lots of expertise can be just as insecure when they suddenly feel like they're beginners. And, you know, sometimes what you'll see, and this is just uh, uh, my, uh, just from my experience, but a sign that you know you have somebody that doesn't that is that is insecure is that they may be like commenting on their past successes like a, oh at my last job i you know i did this or i did that or whatever because they're trying to gain acceptance they're trying to prove their skills um and because the the structure on how you're kind of um, supporting them regarding their position is lacking something, right? So if so, if you experience that, know that you probably have to do a little bit deeper dive, right? So 
provide the new hire with the job description. That's kind of like, you know, the baseline that includes well-defined accountabilities, resources, you know, how you think should be, you should be aware of how things get done. And it's also uh, valuable to schedule. I like weekly or daily, like it just depends, uh, coaching kind of sessions or check-ins. Uh, and it just depends how big your team is. Um, and just so that you get on the path of contributing as soon as possible. That's always been kind of my goal with any teams that I have is that I want to, I want to put the effort and the time at the front end because I want to get to the point where we're being effective. Right. And that we're there. And, and there's, there's a sense of accomplishment whenever you do that with new new hires because then very quickly they ramp up to being a contributor and then they feel good about themselves right um the other other thing on position onboarding that you you should remember is about setting goals so yes you have the job description but i like to always you know it, it's kind of a powerful strategy because of setting clear kind of realistic expectations and milestone expectations, all right, for them. So, you know, I like to assign tasks with uh, an expectation that that would be completed maybe like three, six, nine months or a week or a couple of weeks or whatever. It just, it depends on, uh, on the work that you're doing. So start with targets that you're confident that maybe the new hire will, can meet. And, and if that all goes well, then gradually increase the level of responsibility, right? So that's kind of like, you're kind of, there's a little bit of handholding. Uh, you're probably thinking that a little bit of handholding, but you're trying to set them up for success, right? This is a process, right? You, you, you have to have that opportunity where you can discuss freely, safely, you know, where the gaps are, right? In skill set. Right. And so during when you're having these check ins and you're setting those expectations, you know, that's where you can have really true conversations. What I always like to do is I like to always keep an eye out for faking it till I make it kind of people, because if you're doing that, setting the expectation and you're doing those touch ins, you won't see I'm going to fake it till I make it. You won't see that. But if you don't do that, you might have that happening and then you might have to have a performance conversation. Um, so, you know, new hires that feel kind of grounded in their, whenever they're contributing and they understand how they fit into the company, they are ones that will be confident and loyalty will come faster than you think. Um, whenever that happens. The team onboarding, uh, I'll just briefly touch on this one, but you can kind of sense what this is about. So this is like about new hires, like making them feel like they're not isolated, um, right? And that they're you want them to be socialized properly, right? And because if they're not, like the examples that I gave you, if we're going to ghost them, then you know you're just setting them up to be leaving the job. Right. And building relationships during the first few months can help new hires kind of feel less isolated and they'll feel more confident. So the more that you can focus on that team building uh, piece of it. Um, anyway, so when whenever you focus on that and they feel accepted and welcomed, then they're less likely to feel like that new kid on the block. Right. And sometimes that can happen fairly quick. Right. So the more effort you put into it, the faster that they might make a comment like, oh, I feel like I've been here for years <laughs> and they might only be there like two weeks. Right. So we have another poll uh, coming up. And again, love to get your thoughts on this. Um, so the question that Geneva is going to put up is, would you use these three categories like the company, the position, and the team uh, when you're creating maybe your onboarding process. Just kind of curious if you would. And I'll keep motoring to the next page. Okay. So talked a little bit about retention. 
We talked a little bit about onboarding. Now, how do they complement each other? And you could probably give me these bullet points uh, now that we've kind of discussed both. So by having a well-structured onboarding process, you enable staff, employees to perform and feel motivated from day one, right? That's what we just talked about. They feel integrated in the company or the team, reducing the chances of them leaving. And by allowing staff to understand the policies and the cultures early on, they have a better understanding of how things work and how they can contribute, right? New hires feel may, maybe more comfortable sharing information and it takes the fear away. So you create a safe environment, you create an open dialogue environment where there's all kinds of communication at the front end. You're gonna get to the bottom of a lot of stuff uh, fairly quickly and there won't be no surprises. Smooth transition from, you know, after the hiring process. So feeling, you know, that they're continued to be supported and comfortable in their new role because that's what it's all about, right? Making introductions to the rest of the team and the leadership and they'll feel more integrated into the workplace. The thing is, if they have a welcoming experience, it leaves a positive memory that they will take throughout their career. First impressions count. All right. So a couple more things that I'm going to focus on here is so like other HR practices, onboarding evolves. Uh, you know, you add features to it. You just, it's not just one and done, you know. So here's a couple of things that I like to improve, you uh, in the onboarding process, a couple of, couple of little things that, you know, a lot of companies that I work with, like had a lot of great success with a lot of these things. So when it comes to just the initial onboarding, you know, um, a lot of folks are leaning towards doing, and you might already be doing this, is doing a lot of the stuff online or via email before their first day. So, and complete necessary paperwork before the employee even starts, right? And uh, I've even supported some groups where they're doing kind of videos, a welcome video from the manager. It doesn't replace the call to say, hey, you got the job or a meeting to dis discuss, you know, their offer package or whatever, but it's a really, really nice touch if you do a little bit of a welcome video to say, you know, especially if there is a little bit of a time lag by whenever you're kind of closing the offer out with them until their very first day. It's always, it's such a nice thing to do that you can send them like a little video to say, hey, Sherry, looking forward to you starting on Monday. I just wanted to make sure you didn't have any other questions. Instead of leaving a voice message or sending them an email, the video is a nice touch. All right. So yeah, complete necessary paperwork before the employee even starts, you know, by performing some of those tasks before the start date, their first day can be all about relationship building, creating the rapport with the manager, meeting the teams, getting the lay of the land, then, then the experience is a little different because you got some of that mundane paperwork stuff out of the way uh, before they even started. Just the thought, uh, a lot of companies are kind of shifting in that direction and have for a while now. Um, a welcome plan for the first day. Having like, um, you know, like uh, maybe a few set things in place as you're welcoming a new employee, like might, it will be very beneficial if you kind of said, okay, these three things we're going to do for every employee that comes, uh, that gets hired. And so a few set things in place as you welcome new employees. So then what you have is a consistent way of making them feel part of the team. So this can be something like um, you could do like a welcome card, right? Or having like a box of essentials on you know, their workstation, or you know you could have like company swag uh, there, like a pen or a mug, or you know like stuff that you probably already do. But some companies just don't 
they don't they forget about doing it they say oh no we all get t-shirts or we all get hats at christmas time it's like yeah but we're trying to uh we're trying to keep employees you know from their first day on right so what can we do so that if everybody else is walking around with the hat they got last christmas can we give them one of those hats like you know so they can fit into the culture right sometimes like a team meeting or a lunch works if if that's doable like um where you know they can have personal it's not just like meeting somebody on the production line it's about you know having like a personal time where they can kind of mingle and talk about personal stuff right and what this does is it kind of helps support that mentoring thing that I just mentioned that maybe it'll organically make connections with other employees that'll say, Hey, yeah, I started here. I've been here for 20 years, or I started here a couple of months ago. And so that might, if, if you have that, if you create that um, kind of experience for them, then that connection piece might just organically kind of evolve for you. So anyway, just uh, a couple of things. Uh, um, okay. A uh, few more ways that you can improve your employee onboarding process and a couple of things that are happening right now is the check-ins I talked about. Um, the uh, An onboarding starts when, you know, the person is hired, but extend it until the employee feels confident. So don't have it that, oh, our onboarding process only lasts three months and those set timelines that I talked about. Maybe it needs to be longer for different scope of jobs, uh, or maybe an employee just adapts like faster, slower than others. I like don't be so set on the end date for onboarding, I guess is what I'm saying. A lot of companies are saying there is no end date right? That the check-ins will continue. They, as often as we need, you know, and the check-ins are all about how are things going? What can I do to help you? You know, and depending on the position, this may be often, but just depends on the new person too, as well, because sometimes they might not want that frequency of check-ins, right? So you kind of have to play it by ear. Um, and, you know, and if an, if an employee feels kind of isolated, unsupported, uh, make sure that, you know, you're not, you, that you're doing something about it because you don't want to lose them as an employee. And then your your turnover rate's gonna going to go up, right? So... Um, another thing that, and, and I'm doing quite a bit of work with this recently too, is that a lot of companies are, um, we're working on customizing onboarding. So, you know, not just one size fits all kind of onboarding, but mapping out kind of key points to cover during for certain roles, whenever you're doing onboarding for them. So, you know, creating approaches and what's going to like, um, like one group I'm doing right now is with a bunch of production supervisors. So um, the leaders from a bunch of different facilities are we're doing a, like a joint kind of working group and we're focusing on production supervisors. How do we create a pool? How do we set them up for success? How do we have a really robust performance conversation with them? What goals, you know, what learning and development, all that kind of fun stuff. We're doing a deep dive into that. And how do we retain them? How do we know, like, you know, what is the recipe for this, for that certain role? So what I like to do is um, I like, I liked that uniqueness for certain types of positions. So that's kind of what I listed here on the screen for you is that I like doing that for leadership level positions, maybe supervisor level positions, like I just mentioned, or maybe there is like technical or specialized positions or support roles in your operation that you find that if we did something unique for their onboarding, we probably would have a better retention rate, right? And 
so anyway, just a couple of things, a couple of helpful hints uh, that's happening out there. And uh, we have another poll. So this is our final poll. Uh, so the the question is, do you agree that these ways will help improve your employ employee onboarding processes? What do you think of these that I just mentioned? Just a couple of them, right? Four of them that I mentioned, but uh, what's your thoughts on that? So be kind of curious to hear what you have to say. All right, so I'm getting close to the end. Uh, so I thought you might like to hear about some more example stuff. Everybody loves the examples uh, and want me to do more examples. But when I was uh, telling Gabrielle about the examples that I was going to share today, um, you know, she said she started telling me about some of her experiences. And I'm like, okay, you're coming on the presentation because you're going to share them live with everybody because her stories are great. All right. So, uh, so she has, uh, Gabrielle, do you want to tell us some of your onboarding and retention experience so far in your career? Yes. Thank you, Sherry. So I've had several good and not so good experiences with onboarding in my career in HR. I'm 26 years old. I've been practicing HR for just a short few years, but if I had to reflect on some that I wanted to point out to you today. Um, there was one time that I had a job where a manager didn't foster a motivating and supporting relationship with me on day one. Kind of made me feel a little lost. I felt like I didn't know where I fit in the company. I didn't feel as if I was part of the team. And it really impacted me being motivated to do the work. Um, so, and then in my current role here uh, with Sherry, you know, she's very good on wanting to get to know me, get to know my background. She shares her personal experiences with me, so I get to know her. Um, we're very comfortable on knowing what we need to do and what things that I may need more support on. Uh, we have these casual daily check-ins together where we kind of go over the list of work that we need to do so I can understand expectations, what needs to be done, how things need to be done, and how we're going to go about completing these tasks. And I feel very comfortable and I feel supported and I feel like a very open environment um, if I ever need any more clarification on these tasks. Another one uh, was I had certain expectations with this job going in. But as the job progressed and time progressed, the job and responsibilities kind of shifted, um, which I was not expecting at all. Um, I was given the job description on day one. So these were the responsibilities that were laid out for me. Then all of a sudden it was completely different. And I was no longer interested in the work at all. It made me feel like I didn't want to go into work every day. I, I There was low morale in general. Uh, it impacted my ability to want to stay with that company. So that impacted the retention level very much. With Sherry here, I'm interested. I love the work that we do. It's very hot, fast paced, high level. HR stuff, and I get the opportunity to expand my skills and knowledge. Uh, like I research different platforms and softwares that can make our work more efficient, more elevated. And Sherry's very good at listening to me and being open to these things. And they're going to help our company as a whole. And that's that's great. It It's exciting. It makes me happy and motivated to be here. Uh, my last experience that I'll touch on today uh, is a, I had a job and on day one, it seemed like they didn't have a game plan for me. There was no job description. I had no idea the responsibilities that I was be doing. So my manager would assign me a task. I would go and complete the task with no expectation on how to do the task. And... Then I go, she gave me another task and it was very transactional. And if she didn't have anything to give me, 
it was, oh, go or organize the filing cabinet. <laughs> and I was there for a short period of time with that job. Um, it was very transactional, very disorganized. I did not like making the commute. It was a little bit further away. Uh, so I hated that. And I didn't want to have to go into work and organize the filing cabinet again. <laughs> uh, so with my current position here, I I have a very clear understanding with our daily check-ins. I know what the work that we need to do. I have autonomy and the work that we're doing. I'm excited. I'm engaged in the workload. I love coming to work every day. And we kind of have like the, we map out these short and long-term goals that we set and we continually set them on a, I'd say a weekly basis. Mm. And it's great. Mm. Aw, thanks Gabrielle. Yeah. No uh, problem. I'm gonna have to, I made notes. <laughs> I made notes through that. Do not get Gabrielle to be filing, doing filing in the filing cabinet. <laughs> I don't mind it if it's every once in a while. <laughs> Yeah, that's funny. Thank you, Gabrielle. That was really helpful. Uh, hopefully everybody kind of uh, appreciated her being so honest and upfront and, and giving us a little bit of insight into like into her experience, right? And her age group, right? Not, not to say everybody in her age group kind of feels that way, but um, and kudos to her for being so open and honest and telling us that today, right? So thanks, Gabrielle. Thank you. Okay, so before I wrap up, uh, I just wanted uh, to also mention that um, I like how do you collect, I'm a data person. So obviously, how do you collect employee, employee onboarding data for your company? How do, what's the most common way that you can kind of validate, you know, besides like a lot of things that I've shared with you today is about checklists and, you know, and look at this and the experience of that. The, the data-driven stuff is that you can do is look at your turnover, your employee retention rates and your turnover rates for certain periods of time. Uh, remember the stats that we were talking about, you know, within the first 45 days or the first like month, like, you know, what is the trend on turnover? Um, because if it's if it's within that short period of time, it probably has something to do with the experience of the onboarding of that employee. All right. So I like the data, but data is not the only thing right with the turnover rates, I guess is what I'm talking about. Um, I like the collection of feedback. So I, I don't know, I like surveys, right, uh, for the, the new hires. So survey them assessing how you could maybe improve the onboarding experience. I like that. Like, I would rather them give me advice, right, than rate us on this or that. Like, you know, I would like, I would position it more about kind of like when we do the polls with you today, I'd like that because I want to tweak my approach for the next time. Right. So I look at the onboarding the same way that I'd like to phrase those questions where I'm getting useful information, not like a yes, no, or, you know, an eight out of 10. All right. Kind of thing. And I like getting feedback as it kind of helps me improve the whole process. Right. Like I just said, and it's a great driver for employee engagement. Right. Whenever you get that feedback and we do something with it then they're going to feel good about themselves, right? That they were part of that. Even without the survey piece of it, just the conversations with the new hires will also provide great insight, all right? So make a note of some of the things that they're telling you, even with your check-in conversations, right? That stuff is very important and give that feedback to whoever's helping you with put your onboarding process together, all right? Um, okay. So, uh, two things I always ground back to, uh, onboarding regarding onboarding onboarding is, I don't like to, I, although I might've called it process throughout the, the training, but onboarding, don't think of it as a process because it's all, it's about the experience that the new employee is having. It's all about the experience. 
And, you know, one of my guiding principles, HR guiding principles is that, and I, I think of this like a lot, probably daily uh, in a lot of things that I do is that people might not remember what you have said to them, but they will always remember how you made them feel. And that is so true. And I can reflect back on my whole career and those words kind of ring true for me. So I hope you, I hope you, uh, this topic was helpful. Uh, I just wanted to really share a brief overview, share some of my experiences, my approaches that I take, and hopefully provide you with some great tips to consider. Um, I know we went a little bit over on the time, so I apologize for that. Uh, but thank you so much for attending the session. And if there is any questions, I'd be more than happy uh, to try to answer those uh, now. So. Perfect. Thanks, Sherry. I'm just going to open up our uh, Q&A box here. We do have some questions. Okay. Uh, first question is, can you help define orientation versus onboarding? Yeah. So I like to look at orientation is kind of like the kind of the checklist of uh, them being orientated maybe to their job or um, it, kind of like the specifics of maybe the deep dive into their job description, kind of where, um, where their workstation is, you know, where you go get a uniform, like all that kind of stuff. So the orientation, uh, of kind of the going to, to do your shift. The onboarding is, it doesn't matter what your position is, it's kind of the experience of you being brought into the organization. So if you think of it that way, the onboarding is kind of like the 30,000 foot level. And that's the way I describe them. Um, you might describe them differently, but, and the orientation is more about the, the functional job and the things around the job that is unique to the job that you're filling. So though that's kind of how I look at it. Um, I try to keep it uh, a little bit clear that way. So perfect. good question, but yeah, good, good question. question. It comes up a lot because a lot of people use those uh, terms interchangeably. So yeah, so it does it's come true. Up. I've heard them interchangeably too. Yeah, yeah, it comes up a lot. Uh, next question is, what should I, as the owner, do to make sure that my HR team are recruiting for 2023 and 2024 and not using the same tactics as we did in the 2000s? Yeah, uh, well, I am a big user of generations, of looking at generational data and drivers for generation. I would start with what does your demographics look like in your workforce um, and the traditional drivers of that workforce. You know, if you're doing any kind of engagement kind of surveys, I would I would kind of have a glance at that. Or if you do any kind of feedback uh, methods from employees, I would look, I would look at that because it's all about the culture moving forward. And, you know, with some organizations, we've gone through a little bit of rocky years the last couple of years. And I think we there's a, a focus right now of trying to reestablish the culture because, you know, with COVID and, and all that, pe people were like in isolation. And I think they're craving that kind of relationship piece. So I think moving forward, I would look at some of your practices on um, the team building approach. I would look at your demographics for the, the workplace that you have. And um, yeah, I'd probably, I'd probably start there. And then depending on what you see in that, then you could do a deep dive in, into some other practices and other focuses. But you know, you can go through some of the the checklists that I went through that when I sit with leaders and say, well, you know, how are you doing on the compensation? You know, what do you do? How, what do you give employees? Right. Um, you know, do they know the the scope of the work? Um, you know, did you give them all the resources, tools? I would start with that checklist, like go back to that checklist. But I definitely add over the layer of uh, the generations and the drivers of the certain generations that you have in your workplace, like your demographics. So that's what I would focus on. 
Perfect. In your experience, what are the key elements of successful leadership coaching for employee retention? Um, I think as a leader, I'll, I'll talk about my experience. Um, I think that you have to operate as a team. And if you're really trying to retain, uh, people on your team, you have to focus on their development. Your, your role is not as a people leader. And again, in my opinion, is not to just kind of um, divvy up the work. It, it's that your job, and this is what people have done to, with me in my career, is they've taken me under my under their wing, and they've developed me and and giving me insight into skills, not to adopt what they do, but to explore how I want to be moving forward. And I think that, you know. I think we need to kind of stop and just reflect a little bit that you're what you're doing is you're grooming the next generation of leaders. And you have to keep that in mind that you're not just uh, managing transactions that have to happen today to make a profit, that you are grooming the next generation. And I think as a leader, if you, you know, I, I think if you focus on that, um, you know, it, it, you'll probably point you in the right direction. So. Awesome. Um, next question is, you mentioned CEOs are concerned about employee retention. Why yeah. is it a top issue? Well, like, like because of the marketplace right now, like there's so many options for folks and I think their tolerance level with like um, not being connected with certain leadership is just not there. So, and everybody's looking for, um, everybody's looking for resources at this point, you know, and, and especially if, uh, if, you know, they're a, a good marketable resource, you know, good skills and experience and, and leadership skills, like they're a hot commodity right now. And, you know, and that should be concerning for some leaders out there that aren't doing some retention strategies or focusing on uh, some of the things that I mentioned today um, and focusing on that because you, you have to start like, these are people, right. And you have to start looking at it through that lens that they want to grow and they want to develop and they want to know that you have their interest at heart. Um, and, um, you know, I, and I think that's leaders get that, like some leaders get that, I would say, let me, let me clarify some leaders get that and will focus on that. Um, the ones that, you know, I would say the ones that I know that are not spending a whole lot of focus on that, they're going to be the ones that are going to be experiencing continuous high turnover. Because the, you know, the generations that we're hiring right now, um, you know, they want the the value added stuff that I mentioned today. So. Absolutely. What do you think of having a diversified onboarding process? My understanding of this is using in-person and digital strategies. Yeah, I think, you know, there's all kinds of different methods for for all it depends on your your culture and your your organization so you know i sometimes the online stuff will work better for um certain levels of positions in an organization it doesn't mean that you can't it's kind of that customized thing that i just talked about on a couple of slides ago is that you could do a customized approach for office positions that could be mostly like 90% all online. And, but it's a little harder to do that when you're talking about production floor employees, right? Because a lot of that is kind of hands-on. So you could probably get away with some of the stuff that I mentioned, like in the hire package that mm -hmm. you could be emailing that out prior to the first day, but it, it, it depends on the position and it depends on your culture on what you want to do. Right. Uh, I think everything's up for discussion. And I think that, you know, there's no like kind of 
it, I think the best practices are the best practices that are for you, right? Or for your organization. I don't think there's like, I think there's all kinds of practices out there. You just have to figure out and, and hopefully, you know, some of the stuff that I mentioned today will kind of get you to think, to say, you know what, we should be doing this instead of this, right? Because I think our people would enjoy this better right? Or they'll get, or we might have more participation if we do this, or they'll have um, better knowledge, you know, if we present it this way. And, you know, a lot of clients that I work with right now, uh, I do online with a, a group of engineers, they, everything's all online, but then I'll go to a seafood plant and classroom, you know, and that's just the way it is. Right. And so you have to figure out what works for you. But the big thing is that you need to hone in on the experience the employees are having. That's that's the trigger. Right. So. These are good questions. Thank you for them. <laughs> yeah, very good questions. We have three yeah. more. Oh, OK. Um, can you provide insights into collecting feedback from employees on their onboarding experience? Yeah, like the survey stuff. So um, sometimes you could, yeah, you can do the surveys. Like I mentioned, like, you know, I like to ask them about like, you know, was this, you know, was that helpful? But more importantly, you know, do you do, is there something that we didn't provide to you? Right. Or is there something that you wish we had have done? Uh, because we can do it now for you, but you know what, I'm going to incorporate that into the process, right? Because I think it's a really good idea. And I think that's where that engagement comment came from, that I think that if you have that dialogue and that check-in with employees, and it's really genuine about like, you know, was that helpful? Like that checklist that you got or that material? I know there was a lot of reading in that, but was it helpful at the end of the day? Like I would ask, I'd, I'd be like, I'm interviewing them. I would ask them because I want to know the details of, you know, they don't want to read a 50 page manual, right? Unless it's a requirement, right? But then it's like, maybe I can do a scaled down version of it, right? For them uh, during onboarding and that they need to reference the 50 page one after then, then go for it. But that my advice, whenever you're trying to solicit feedback is the survey may help from the, the experience uh, overall general on what your approach is to validate it or to change it. But then it's not going to replace the one-on-one -on -one conversation that you're going to be having with the employee. And I think your feedback collection has to be a combo. So, perfect. <clears throat> the next question, I think we touched a little bit on in a, in a previous question, but I'm just going to ask this one in case you have anything else to add. Okay. With baby boomers and Gen X getting ready to retire or are already retiring, what should the HR team be focusing on? Well, um, yeah, like, a, well, I, again, I'm a data person, so I would be looking at how much runway I have in front of them uh, and how soon is, uh, you know, and how soon before they retire. And then I would be looking at the practices that I have in place regarding, am, am I building the next leaders or do I have to go externally for the next leaders? So I would be looking at that. I like to look at that stuff at least three to five years in advance. No matter, and I don't need a commitment that so-and-so is going to retire. I just look at the data and uh, do a little bit of analytics on that and, you know, put a game plan together. Because chances are, if you if you leave it for a shorter window of time than three to five years, you're not going to be able to groom the people internally. Uh, to be a replacement. So I like to always, you know, at least three to five years out. And yeah, you know what, a lot of, a lot of companies are kind of holding their breath and crossing their fingers, right, that they don't leave because we don't have anybody. And, and I had that conversation, I think it was yesterday, with an employer that said, like, we don't have a successor, but we're just going to do whatever we can to try to get them to stay. I'm like, that is not a strategy. That is not a plan right? You have to figure out, uh, you have to figure out something else. You have to be looking at 
the development and the training that I talked about, which can start right from day one, you know, on talking about, you know, career um, uh, aspirations that uh, new employees have. There's nothing more motivating than somebody asking, like, you know, how can I help groom you for your next job? Even if you're just starting this one, it's like, that's what you should be focusing on. And, you know, and if you don't, not everybody is up for that, though, either, right, that a lot of people just like the job that they're doing, they don't have any aspirations to advance. And, um, you know, so there's nothing wrong with that either. Um, because the, those people provide stability in your workforce, too. So they're a huge, huge asset, right? So anyway, hopefully that answers the question. Perfect. Um, so we're going to wrap up the Q&A portion here now, and I'm going to pass us back to Tracy for some closing remarks. Thank you very much, Sherry. It was a very interesting topic. I know everybody struggles with retention and recruitment uh, over all of our subsectors. So I hope all of our viewers today got lots out of it. Like Geneva said, we will be uh, we have recorded this session. We will be putting it up on our YouTube channel and sending the link to you as well. Uh, Sherry is also going to provide her uh, her PowerPoint presentation for us too, so that you can take a look at it again uh, later on. I'd also like to tell everyone that we will be having our next webinar series, and it's going to be only in a couple of weeks because we're trying to get it in before everyone disappears or gets too busy for the Christmas break. And that will be featuring Dr. Lizette Rees Paulino and Raja Hatoum. And it's called Becoming an Effective, Emotionally Intelligent Leader for Your Workforce. So that's also going to be another interesting topic and, and uh, divvies very well into our, our skills training across Canada program uh, as we move into more of the leadership thing. So I hope you can all attend. Thank you very much again, Sherry and Gabrielle, for sharing all your insights and answering all our questions. And we'll see you all next time. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.